Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P, Joe Pizapia. That is Kyle Yates. And today, it's all about league winners to target. That's right. These are the guys that are going to put money in your pocket, going to put swag back in your walk, the players that are going to change the future of your 2021 season. And I am so excited about our guest. He's joining us from all the way across the pond in England. He's one of my favorite people in the fantasy football industry. He has got a great story of how he came to love NFL and now has become a huge host of a podcast over there in the UK. He's the one, the only Adam Murphy from Five Yard Rush. Murph, welcome to the program, my friend. I am so excited to have you on the show today. The honor's on mine to be amongst you two fine gentlemen. Um, absolutely brilliant to, to be here. And I, am I right in thinking I'm your first uh, British ever guest? Oh, that's a good question. Yates, I believe so. We're breaking ground here. I would here. think so. I would think so. It's yeah, all would... about spreading the diversity and, and, and opening up the conversation, Murph. And Murph, here's a good question on that point. Why is it that everything that British people say sounds smarter to us as Americans? Like, do you notice that? Like, you could say something and be like, yeah, David Johnson is a, is a first round pick. And we'd be like, yeah, you know what? He's right. He's got a great point there. <laughs> Because of someone like James Corden breaking ground for us, he he, he probably didn't say anything <laughs> smart at all, but he, um, he he sort of just sounds like he's being smart, and I think he's like classically conditioning everyone on on the Late Late Show over there with like carpool karaoke, like he sounds smart talking absolute gibberish in a car. So uh, I guess he's done all the work for us and, and he's a great ambassador to our country as a result. So we salute you, James Corden. Thanks a lot. There, there you go. Paving the way. And, uh, and Murph, you know, real quick, give us the story because I think it's a great one. And then we're going to jump into the players and we're going to jump in to also some listener mailbag later on too. But you know, how did this happen? How did this, this young kid from England end up becoming a, a football fanatic and now a fantasy football writer because not only do you host the five yard rush podcast but you also uh, are one of the co-authors of the uh, fantasy football playbook that you guys have been running the last few years you also do a lot of great charity work in the industry which i always love to highlight and help out whenever i can i try to do the same so tell us that that quick story of how you actually got started yeah well it all started in sort of year 2000 actually so my mom um had uh, invested in a business with my aunt and uncle in florida my aunt and uncle had a holiday home in in just uh near kissimmee actually so near disney and um so at 14 i moved over to the us <laughs> um and got thrown in at the deep end so i went from a, a school of several hundred people here in the uk to a school of about four thousand people in orlando <laughs> florida right opposite universal studios made some friends quickly everyone wanted to know the english guy it wasn't the only english one there but there was a there was a few very very select few and someone said to me oh do you want to play fantasy football and i was like well i played that in the uk um over in in, in those days when we played fantasy football which or fancy soccer in the uk um it used to be a mail-in kind of job so you used to submit your team via the wow. post every week and then you get an update like a week later through the mail like this is how it used to be run um and i said well as long as it's not like that i said no there's a website and everything i was like okay cool uh, year one absolutely stunk the place up year two won it um i traded for priest Holmes and had uh the damon tomlinson so i i piggybacked those two all the way to a title which was great and fast learning curve and yeah i became a buccaneers fan went to games went to the super bowl when they won it the first time round as well and um when i moved back to england in 2005 um, struggled a little bit to follow it at first, but they've always had some coverage here. And then 2007, we got the international games, and uh, right. so the following's been building more and more every single year. You know, I got to watch the Buccaneers lose three times in London. They've yet to win here, which is annoying. Um, and then, uh, yeah, a few years ago, a friend of mine or my my buddy Stocks, he was just started a podcast. He said, you know, why don't you come on? Um, we're just going to chat and we did it and people started listening and then we started putting some content out. We created a website, people started playing in our leagues and we just built this nice little community now of, of people that in the UK who just, I, I really hate the random NFL.com leagues that you just join, you set a lineup week one and everyone right. kind of gives up. Like that's not a good experience for anyone. So my mission is to kill those leagues dead 
and mm-hmm. make sure people in the UK who perhaps don't have ten friends to play NFL like fantasy football right, right. to be a conduit for that and say right okay guys uh, you, here's an active league you can play in against real people we will set lineups every week and it's kind of spiral from there you mentioned we do charity work and yeah we've written the playbook now last couple of years which has been awesome and people have bought that and the US of guys have really supported us and there's been lots of sales there so it's just been something I just love doing and contributing. And this is, this is a highlight to, to be here with you two. You've both been on my podcast, but it's great to That's be right. here on, on yours. So um, yeah, it's just long may it continue. I just love the game and uh, I'm looking forward to Thursday night at 1am <laughs> when the bucket was well, Friday morning, technically when the bucket is no. kick off against the Cowboys. Uh, you know, and and it really, the NFL has become such an international game. And that's what makes it so cool is that, like, we're literally, I know, you know, here at Fantasy Pros, like, when we were doing the draft coverage dates, we had people watching in Germany, we had people watching in Brazil, they were messaging yeah. us. And, and that's what's so cool is, like, you know, the NFL feels like it's become this international game. And I know Murph's told me so many times how crazy it is there it's all hard to get tickets for these games and how you know people show up for it and what a what a cool thing right yates to be able to facilitate leagues for a bunch of people who do love it and it's still growing there at a very quick rate but still what a, what a cool i don't know it's just it feels so great to be a part of something that is now become such an international phenomenon where it was just such a popular thing in the states it really is and one thing that i took away from that is that i complain all the time about being on the east coast and the like 825 starts uh for games I need to stop complaining about yeah. that because, yeah, if you're watching there at 1 a.m. or whatever, or, you know, keep staying up well, for that. Yeah. It's, yeah. Only, it's only because Tom Brady signed and we won the Lombardi, you know, so it kind of, you have to take the rough of the smooth. Normally it's 6 o'clock on a Sunday because uh, the Buccaneers just weren't on prime true. time for so many years. True. This is um, true. No one wanted this for Sundays. No one wanted this for Monday night or Thursday night. But you play the one, obviously, you know, yeah. uh, with the one mandatory thursday night game a year that you play and it normally begins yeah, it's the steelers and some the, the blessing the blessing and the curse yeah, yeah well it's a lot more blessing because you get to yeah, hoist that lombardi yep. trophy all right <laughs> speaking of trophies and cool things i want to remind everybody about our giveaway at fantasypros.com slash contest once again thanks to our friends at pristine auction all you got to do is leave a review of the show on apple Podcasts or Castbox. screenshot that bad boy Join us on YouTube, subscribe, get a three times entry, and don't forget to click that little notifications button when you do, and you can win a Clyde Edwards Alaire autographed jersey. It's not going to give away itself, and once you're entered, you're entered the rest of the year, so go do it now, fantasypros.com slash contest. We only have a few days left for the CEH helmet that is so cool. It's the black helmet with the red Chiefs logo, autographed by CEH. Again, thanks to our friends at Pristine Auction, and... Fantasy football season is here. Your drafts are here. Are you worried? Do you feel like you're not ready for your draft? Or even if you do feel like you're ready, if you want to take it to the next level and you want to upgrade your subscription with us to Fantasy Pros, this is how you do it. FantasyPros.com slash offers. All you got to do is make a $10 deposit on one of our partner sites over there on that link at Underdog, Fandor, DK, right? Then after you do that, 10 bucks. You get six free months of our Hall of Fame package. That is a $65 value. You get all the cool stuff with the Draft Wizard, the Cheat Sheets, the Draft Assistant with Sync, everything, plus all the amazing things like the new IDP show that's behind the paywall. We gave you one for free, but the rest you got to pay for, right? But you can with just 10 bucks, Hall of Fame package. There you go, fantasypros.com slash offers. That's the place to do it. And this is the place to talk about league winners. So let's kick things off here. Let's start with the running backs. Murph, who's the first running back you want to talk about that you think could be a potential league winner in 2021? This is this is the kind of pick that's going to get me kicked off this show pretty quickly. But I'm going to sell you both <laughs> on it, right? Um, David Montgomery. Now, I know how divisive David Montgomery is. I know people talk about how, oh, we can only beat up on bad defenses. Oh, well, you know, he's not really that great. Listen, let's, let's give this guy some respect. He was the RB4 last year. Yes, okay, CMC went down. A few other running backs didn't do so well. Zeke didn't have a good season. Yes, I understand all of that. But this guy was a sixth-round pick last year. Final six games, and again, yes, you can talk about the bad defenses all you like. He had 116 rushing attempts, 598 yards, seven touchdowns, and then he also had 24 receptions, 226 yards, one touchdown in his final six games. He was the RB1 over the final six games of the season. This guy won you leagues last year. Now, I get it. He's going to play some good defenses this year. People are like, well, well, you know, he's going in the third round, so he's getting a bit more respect. But I want to highlight, and the reason, you know, we talk about league winners. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about David Montgomery's last six games that he's going to face this season. 
he's got a pretty good schedule for the playoffs and just getting into the playoffs coming into this season. Um, last six games, he plays Detroit, who last year were the single worst defense giving up running back, points to running backs last season. 27.5 fantasy points per game they gave up. Then he's got Arizona, 15th worst, so about mid-table, but slightly below average. Then he's got Green Bay, who were the sixth worst. Minnesota, who were the fifth worst. The best defense he's got on the way in is Seattle. They were just above midway, 18.2 fantasy points per game. Then he's got the Giants to finish off. I mean, it's an absolutely plumb schedule. He's not playing any of the top defenses. And I appreciate there's going to be some change from last season to this season. It always is. New players coming in, new coaching schemes. But at the end of the day, he's not really facing any any powerhouses. He's not got any competition. They didn't draft any competition for him. He's not playing good Ds. This guy could be just as good. And we've seen what happens when he gets on a roll. He pummels that first defense. Mm -hmm. He could just run it downhill keep pummeling it and keep getting those attempts so for me i'm looking at that final six games and i'm thinking david montgomery in the third round fourth round if you can get him on that turn yeah i'll, I'll take that all day long i think he's a surefire league winner well everyone who listens to the show knows that i support that choice my friend and it's because <laughs> of where you're getting him you're right it's it's not that he is the talent of delvin cook or cmc but he is one of these guys that if you give him 20 plus carries some running backs are better the more they touch the football I think Montgomery's one of those guys. All right, we're going to have a few more running backs here. Yates, let's go with your first one. Who's the league winner, the difference maker in 2021 for you? It's really funny. We didn't coordinate these names ahead of time, but I think there's a lot of parallels between my guy and David Montgomery from last year, and that's Trey Sermon. Trey Sermon is going in the sixth round right now. I got him in the sixth round of the Sleeper Bowl last night, and you talk about the schedule that he has at the mm -hmm. end of the year. From week 11, week 11 on, Jacksonville. Minnesota, Seattle, Cincinnati, and then in the playoffs, Atlanta, Tennessee, and Houston. Trey Sermon, by the midway point of the season, or even, I mean, maybe even earlier because Raheem Mostert is dealing with a little bit of a back injury at currently, like, he could eventually take over this job completely to the point where he's getting the, the goal line work, he's getting the majority of the carries, and then you tell me that he gets those defenses down the stretch. There's not a single tough matchup in that, in that schedule. So Trey Sermon... From a matchup perspective, we're looking at these guys that are going at a bit of a discount that you can add to your roster now in hopes that when it gets to crunch time there, when it gets to the point of making those playoff runs, that you can plug them into your lineup as a solid RB2. Trey Sermon from week 11 on has a fantastic schedule, just kind of like David Montgomery from last year. And spoiler alert, Murph, I think Sermon was one of your three running backs that you selected as well. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely love Sermon this year. And again, you know... Again, you, it's, you've hit the nail on the head. I had exactly the same point with the schedule. But also, you know, he's, you look at the competition there. This is the weakest sort of competition backfield that we've had there for the last few years. You've got Mostert, who at some point will go down. He always goes down. There's a massive durability, durability issue with him. No doubt there's talent there. But uh, Jeff Wilson, he's going to be starting the year on the pup uh, with that tall meniscus. Who knows when he comes back? Gorman, we kind of know what Gorman is at this point. He's a backup. You got Mitchell. Oh, there's, there's no one there really that you can get excited about. And the other thing is, I'm a firm believer, and I'll talk about this again with another guy that that will come up. You've got to follow what the team are doing. They moved up in the draft to get Sermon. They have a plan for him. You know what they're going to do. You know, last season Jeff Wilson was their lead running back with 600 yards. <laughs> that's not going to happen this season, that's for sure. And yeah, I'm, I'm a Yates all the way. I think I think Sermon is a, is a talent that's been slept on far too much, and people are too concerned about what he did or didn't do in college. He did a pretty good job, especially towards the end of his college career. If anyone saw the 331 yards he get put up against Northwestern, this guy can play, and he's going to have the opportunity. And he's durable. He's got plenty of tread on the tires left. I'm with you, Yates. I think uh, I think he's an absolute steal, and someone who will deliver championships to someone come January. Make it three for three. In fact, I'm willing to reach for him. Uh, I love yeah. Trey Sermon, and especially with ETN out now. That becomes all of a sudden the new guy that I'm willing to reach on because I just feel like that's, you know, it's it's Williams, it's it was ETN, but now it's not, and now Trey Sermon. And it feels like right now, Trey Sermon, you have to kind of elevate him a little bit more because now the pool is a little more shallow with those running mm -hmm. backs. And you know what? Like you said, plenty of tread left on the tires. I like that as well. Uh, so, yeah, so let's go back to you for another running back uh, sure. since you both agreed on Trey Sermon, which should tell everybody a lot. Uh, give me uh, your second running back that you think could be a league winner this year. 
So even before the Sony Michelle trade, uh, I was talking about Daryl Henderson and saying, get this guy onto your rosters because he is still going at a value. And now people are saying that they are completely scared off of Daryl Henderson because of the Sony Michelle trade, even though Sean McVay came out and reaffirmed what I said was that he is simply just a depth piece because they don't want to go into the season if something were to happen to Daryl Henderson with Xavier Jones and Jake Funk as the primary guys that they have to turn to in this backfield. So Daryl Henderson is going to have a clear role. Is he going to be a bell cow in the sense that Najee Harris is going to be a bell cow? Absolutely not. He never was going to be. But in a top five scoring offense, this is the guy that you want to get on your roster where he's incredibly efficient with his opportunity. He's very talented. He can be a pass catcher out of the backfield and for an offense that I think is going to be putting up points on the board. So Daryl Henderson right now, I had him at RB15 prior to the Sony Michel trade. I talked about that on a recent podcast. He's still at RB15 for me. And right now, there are people that are ranking Daryl Henderson outside their top 30 running backs on the year. And people in ADP do not want to go anywhere near him. That means that you can get Daryl Henderson in the 6th, 7th round some places in your drafts as your RB3, RB4 like that is just ridiculous value for a guy who is going to be the predominant running back in a top five scoring offense. That just doesn't happen. Daryl Henderson, I called him a league winner in June because of his upside. If something were to happen to Cam Akers, now the worst case scenario happened, of course, and we never want to see that, but we have to plan for it in fantasy football. It did. Daryl Henderson is still a league winner. Murph, do you feel the same way about Henderson that it's also still coming at a value enough where you think it could potentially be just that? I think that the Sony Michelle news is fantastic news for Daryl Henderson because the problem is with Daryl Henderson is a little bit of durability. And when you've got Funk and, and you've got Xavier Jones who aren't really NFL proven and haven't taken a lot of snaps, you're going to get games, especially when they're a bit tight, where Henderson might have to go in that red zone and then that's where he could break down. I would rather see a couple of touches in a game for Henderson, let him go to Michelle. And Henderson plays 17 games. I see. Because that was my one real issue with Henderson was... That's a good point. I'm not convinced he's going to play 17 games if he's going to carry... And I'm not saying he's going to be the bell cow, but there's going to be situations where there wasn't a reliable talent. If the game is close, he's going to go in no matter how tired he is. Now with Michelle, especially as a goal line back, you know, Michelle's not a bad player. He is what he is. Like, he's not a first-round pick. There was a reach there, but... He'll do a job and he'll he'll carry the ball and he'll just rest Henderson a little bit just to make sure he doesn't get overtired. And that's I always worry about running backs where there is no notable backup, where there is no one there with a lot of experience. With a lot, and we've seen it over and over again where these guys go into the red and burn out. So mm-hmm. I actually think the Michelle news is great news for Henderson. I'm with you, Yates. I've got him in that sort of 15 to 17 spot, just somewhere around there. you know. And I think he can outperform that really can we've seen what McVay does they've got the most efficient rushing offense in the nfl over the last two seasons yeah wheels up a six seven round is no brainer even in the fourth if, if i've gone wide right. receiver heavy i'm taking him there i'm not gonna let someone come in and, and, and snipe him i think he's the best value on the board once you get in round four yates let's go back to you again because we already got some uh, murph love on henderson along with you give me your last one then we'll go back to murph and we'll move on to <laughs> wide receiver There is not a ton of statistics that I can bring to this one. This is I am throwing something out there and I'm going to see if it sticks. Uh, I'm going with Tony Jones Jr., the running back for the New Orleans Saints here. I think that there's been a ton ton of positive buzz for him uh, coming out of the preseason. He has been talked about Sean Sean Payton saying that he could be the RB2 here Uh, over Latavius Murray. We could see Latavius Murray cut here uh, as the rosters trim down. So if that is the case, then Tony Jones, I mean, he's currently not even in our ADP consensus. Uh, he's RB 132 in ECR currently. So if you can get him, I got him in the sleeper bowl at uh, with my last pick, 16th round. I didn't take a kicker or defense. I took him with my last pick because I was like, I just want to see if he gets this RB2 job. If he does, then I am 100% keeping him on my roster and potentially rolling him out as a flex option. I want to see what this volume looks like for him, but there's opportunity here and Tony Jones Jr. No one's talking about him. I want to make sure that I at least talk about him here as a potential league winner, just like no one was really talking about James Robinson last year, but right. he emerged in the preseason and became a league winner. I'm going to see if that happens. If lightning strikes twice here with Tony Jones Jr. Yeah. I kind of have him in that same grouping of my rankings as Ramondre Stevenson Roundtree, like these guys that are, you know, in those deeper leagues, especially when you need more running back depth. And this is why you make sure that you're using, you know, the draft, assistant with sync because when you use the cheat sheet creator and things like that you want yates's cheat sheets he's gonna have that guy on his cheat sheet so am i so we're gonna have you prepared for that murph who is your third running back that can be a league winner this year 
Well, yeah, he's just mentioned him, but I, I'm going to go with James Robinson. And look, this one's a bit cheating now that Etienne's gone down, but I wasn't really overly worried about Etienne eating too much into Robinson. Yes, okay, he was going to be a slight arrow down. Etienne's there, he's a number one. And Roth, you know, he's a first round draft pick, you know, he's always going to get some role in that backfield. But people kind of don't really know what to expect from Urban Meyer. Now, I, you know, I'm very familiar with Florida Gator with Urban Meyer. I've watched a lot of uh, Ohio State, Urban Meyer. He's going to play a spread offense. Now, for people who aren't overly aware of what spread offense is, it's four wide receiver sets. Etienne was going to play out wide. He was going to play in some sort of hybrid sort of off the backfield, and he was going to catch short-distance passes. So he was going to eat into all of Robinson's you know, catching potential. But Robinson was still going to run the ball. Now that's not going to happen. Let me tell you some things about this Jacksonville team that excited me, which... It's quite a stretch considering they went one and fifteen. Well, first of all, they, well, let's talk about Robinson last year. You know, he went, he was the RB seven last year, and he missed the last three games. If you project out his season, two hundred and seventy four attempts, one thousand two hundred twenty three yards, eight touchdowns, fifty six catches, three hundred ninety three receiving yards, three receiving touchdowns, it would have put him near the RB four. So he would have been the best of the rest behind the elite three. Now, with the spread offense coming in, as I've mentioned. There's some statistics I've got here from Football Outsiders I want to drop because this is really pointing towards where Robinson can exceed expectations, especially where he is right now. So last year, Jacksonville, when they were against six or fewer defenders in the box, their handoffs went for 6.3 yards per carry. So they were really, really effective at running the football, which is why they still ran the football so much when they were losing games because it was their best weapon. It was the most effective way that they could move the ball down the field. There were 6.2 yards per play on RPOs. They led the league in back screens with 33, and they gained 8.2 yards per play. Last season, they were also the bottom five when using... So they were the bottom five teams in the NFL using play action, but they still gained seven yards per play when they did. So they've got all the foundation there with Robinson and everything that they've done previously. All right, it's a new coaching offense. It's a new scheme. We talked about the spread offense. But there's going to be so much more play action this year, so much more RPO, so much more back screens. All of this is going to be enhanced even further. James Robinson's going to be at the heart of it. And he's just going to get a lot more usage now that Etienne isn't there. Etienne was going to eat into some of his back screens and some of the RPO stuff. But now, mm-hmm. now Robinson is going to get that exclusively. Carlo Hyde isn't going to eat into any of this. <laughs> Carlos Hyde is not going to get a look in. You know, James Robinson potentially, with this additional usage, if we if he follows what Urban Meyer wants him to do and what we expect from Urban Meyer based on what he's done historically, would not shock me if James Robinson is a top five running back this year. And it's unfortunate given what's happened to Etienne, but we're in the situation where we are now. His ADP is wonky because obviously we've still got the Etienne data in there. It's right. still quite fresh. So I think he's going in like the sixth round. I, For me, I think if, if jo- James Robinson's there late third, I'd be grabbing him because I really see that top five upside. He, he proved it last year. He can do it. But all those stats are just giving you from football outsiders. I think for me, he, I'm looking at him thinking he can easily finish as a top five back this year. Yeah, uh, I would agree with you. I've moved him up considerably. In fact, we talked about it earlier this week with Pat on our show and Pat Fitzmaurice about, look, you know, you might not love a player, but – with the certain uh, certain circumstances that are now ahead of you, you have to kind of adjust your thinking. And I think you just laid out perfectly how to adjust your thinking now to James Robinson because of the circumstance with Travis Etienne now out. And also what you saw last year and a lot of good that you saw last year. Let's see what kind of good we can find from our wide receivers, Yates. Let's start with a wide receiver name from you that can be a league winner to target in 2021. It's Jalen Waddle, wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins. Uh, I mean, Waddle, you are looking for the guys that have the potential to finish much higher than where they are being drafted, right? That's how they become these league winners in our minds. And Jalen Waddle, I mean, we've talked about it, Joe, like his ADP is rising, but it's still not to the point where I think that he, uh, he, this guy has top 24 upside at the wide receiver position, and he's being drafted outside the top 40 currently. So Jalen Waddle, his skill set, I've talked about it nonstop, his skill set fit uh, just matches perfectly with Tua Tungavailoa's where Waddle is going to be open constantly. No defender in the NFL is going to be able to stick with Jalen Waddle. And then also he has the contested catch ability to be able to go up and make these contested catches that he's not just a speed guy, right? He's a well-rounded receiver. 
Tua is going to be feeding him the ball in this offense underneath because once a once a receiver gets open, Tua is going to get the ball out and he's going to get the ball into their hands and let them create, which is why I think we're in for big years from both Jalen Waddle and Miles Gaskin. So Devontae Parker is struggling with injury. Will Fuller, we know his injury history. There is a path here for Jalen Waddle to easily lead this team in targets and see over 100, maybe even 115 targets in this offense in year one. If Tua is as good as he's been advertised here throughout the preseason and training camp and all that, then Waddle is going to finish way above where he's being drafted. So Jalen Waddle is a guy that I'm getting in every single draft that I can. <laughs> you and me both, and Yates and I have a running bit here now all week of, it's like a game of chicken, who can move Waddle up higher in their rankings? Because right. we both have him at 36. I'm at 34 now, Yates. Where are oh. you? I think I, I think I moved him up to 34. No, uh, no! I did. Oh. I've got him at 34. <laughs> All right, we'll see what happens Monday when we come back here. (laughs) Let's see see who steers the different way first. Murph, drop me some wide receiver names. Let's start with your first one. Right. I'm going to go with my boy, Robbie Anderson. I've been talking about him all offseason. Now, Robbie Anderson, for me, in drafts, with how he's priced so far, he's effectively like, and I'm going to mention this joke because you're Italian, uh, Super (laughs) Mario Brothers, right? He's like when you go into the one of those random boxes and you get a one-up, an extra life. Uh-huh. That's what Robbie Anderson is in fantasy like drafts this. right now. Like because if you if you whiff on one of your first picks, say around that round four to seven, you hit the RB dead zone, you get the wrong guy, goes down, get a wide receiver, gets a bit bummed out, don't worry. Draft Robbie Anderson. He is your extra life in drafts because this guy's being drafted right now as the wide receiver 32. And I still do not understand this now when i started drafting way back in april may because i'm a masochist and just absolutely (laughs) enjoy drafting all year round like just give me a draft and i'll do it um he was going in the 10th round then he's been the ninth and then we got to june and he crept into the eighth he's still going in the seventh round for a guy who finished wide receiver 20 last year with teddy bridgewater (laughs) throwing him the ball you know and this is what this is it. So I'm going to give you some things. And I think Robbie Anderson had probably the quietest and sneakiest uh, wide receiver two season we've probably ever seen. I'm going to read mm-hmm. some things off. I'm going to shock you. First of all, he had seven top 18 finishes last season. Mm-hmm. That tied sixth amongst all wide receivers last year. By the way, the people, the, the players that finished above him, Adams, Diggs, Hopkins, Metcalf, Jefferson, Hill, all those guys... In fact, Hill didn't even finish above him. Hill actually finished with the same amount. All those guys are going in the first five, six wide receivers off the board. Mm. So, <laughs> right. you know, there's nobody there's nobody except that elite talent that's got more top 18 finishes last season. Then we look at what he did with Darnold. They played, you know, once Darnold came back from that injury, they played 12 games in a row towards the end of the 2019 season. Mm-hmm. In that Adam Gaze offense, he either exceeded 85 yards or scored in six of those games. So half the time, He was a wide receiver too, effectively. And that was in an Adam Gaze offense that was pretty putrid. Then we look at what they did last season. So last season with Carolina, only 28% of Carolina's pass attempts, according to Warren Sharp's football analysis, actually traveled beyond 10 yards. Mm. (laughs) So that's why they moved on from Bridgewater. They wanted someone who could actually get the ball um, out of the arm, get it downfield. And still, with all of that, Robbie Anderson was 10th overall in receptions last year. 95 receptions for over 1,000 yards last year. And then the secret got out this week because all all year long, I've been talking about how Robbie Anderson is an absolute steal. He's, I've got him at wide receiver 15. I've got no problem putting him there because I wow. just think he's absolutely going to crush it. Because he's got no competition, no Curtis Samuel there. Marshall plays in a different role, you know is an easy route to him getting another 95, maybe even more receptions this year. And then what have the franchise done? Well, they've just paid him $29.5 million over the next two years with $20 million guaranteed. They've just paid him as the alpha in that offense. So he's getting more money than Diggs. He's getting more money than Adams. Now I know they're going to change and they're all going to get new contracts. Right. But he's being paid as a top 15 wide receiver in this league. Now, Caroline, this coaching staff, they love him. He's a temple. Matt Rule knows him. He's got a, a connection with with Darnold. Things are only going to improve. The ball's going to go downfield. Give me – I've taken Robbie Anderson in nearly 80% of my drafts because he's just 
basically free and he's that extra life because he's going to replace someone who gets injured. He's going to give you top 15 production. I couldn't agree more. I've been drafting him everywhere also. In fact, also Waddle. And it's great because these are two names that I want to highlight once again for those of you who are you know, more in that camp like I am, which is I want to take care of running back early and often. And you're looking for wide receivers who are going to outperform their ADP. These are the guys that are league winners because they save you that production, right? Maybe you missed out on that elite tier wide receiver. So how do you make it up? You make it up with guys like Waddle, guys like Robbie Anderson. Yates, give us another guy that you can make up some productivity with. Since joining the Rams in 2017, Robert Woods is ninth in total targets, eighth in receptions, and ninth in total receiving yards. And that was with Jared Goff as his quarterback. He was also 26th in the NFL in terms of total touchdowns throughout that time span, too. So, And that was with a very down year two years ago as far as a touchdown rate and touchdown, uh, touchdown expectation. It bounced back a little bit last year. I think that it is about to take off this year. So Robert Woods, I mean, for where he is going in drafts, his ADP has started to rise. He was around wide receiver 20 to start the offseason. He's now at wide receiver 15. I've still got him above that. Uh, I am taking Robert Woods over Chris Godwin this year. I'm taking him definitely over Mike Evans, DJ Moore, these other guys, because Robert Woods comes with an incredibly safe floor. We know that the target volume is going to be there. And then also now he has the touchdown upside because I've talked about it. What happens if Matthew Stafford, which could very realistically happen, Matthew Stafford throws for 35 touchdowns this year. Where are those touchdowns going? They're going to Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, and Tyler Higby. They're not going elsewhere. So I think Robert Woods this year has a chance. He's underrated every single year. He has the chance to absolutely blow the doors off this year with Matthew Stafford in town. And he's a number one. I mean, let's be honest. He, he, he can be a number one fantasy wide receiver. He is a number one, basically. And once again, when you're at the turn in a draft, Yates, right? We've been talking about this quite a bit. Mm-hmm. If you double up on RB and you're looking for wide receivers, Robert Woods typically is there for the taking in most of these yep. drafts. We did a mock yesterday in case you missed it. You can go back and watch. That same kind of thing happens. In fact, I think I ended up with Robert Woods in that draft after I started mm-hmm. running back, running back. So it's there. We're trying to give you the blueprint. Give us another guy, Murph, that is in that blueprint for you in 21. <laughs> Well, I had Robert Woods as well. Um, well, well, let's because, go. Let's double up then, baby. I, I, yeah, because Robert Woods, as you say, is the most underrated wide receiver in football. Um, I came on one of your shows last year, Joe, and I said that this guy was massively underrated. And mm-hmm. and sure enough, he, he still was. He was being drafted in the sixth round last year. He's been drafted in the fourth round this year. But, you know, th- it, Yates has kind of summed it all up. But the one thing I would add to this is durability. This guy doesn't mm-hmm. miss games. Right. right? Only Tyler Lockett has played more games in the last three years at wide receiver hmm. than Robert Woods. This guy Funny. plays safe floor. You know, his worst season in the last three, he's averaged 12 and a half points a game in half point PPR. You know, this guy is as safe as houses. And as you say, with, with Stafford, add to that rocket, you know, even Stafford, 40, 40 touchdowns isn't outside that range of outcomes either. So, yeah, I, I just, I'm all in on, on Robert Woods. If I can walk away from a draft with running back, running back and get Robert Woods, Robbie Anderson. Let's go. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm pumped. Uh, absolutely pumped. I think it's uh, it's an absolute lock there. I would also highlight Robert Woods as a salary cap steal because mm-hmm. in those drafts too, when you're bidding on players and you're looking to save a little cash somewhere, Robert Woods is that perfect guy to identify because you can get similar productivity for, I would say many dollars less typically. Oh, yeah. I, we're talking about six, seven, eight, who knows, depending on the draft. Every single one of them is different, but that's another format in particular where Woods, I think, should shine. All right, so Murph, let's go to another one of your wide receivers here and close out this before we move on to quarterback and tight end. Well, let's let's go with Keenan Allen. Now, Keenan Allen, again, is another player who I'm surprised has not reached that top 24 status. Um, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, when you look at Keenan Allen, you have to look at some of the things that have happened in order to get him to where he is and, and what's going to happen this season. So first of all, probably the biggest thing that happened to Keenan Allen this year is that they drafted Rashawn Slater in the first round. Now that offensive line was below average. This that is being putting polite. it kindly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's putting it kindly. It's a family show, right? So it is. That's, <laughs> so, you know, adding Rashawn Slater was an absolute slam dunk pick. Um, He's got immense talent. And we've seen what happens when you add supreme offensive line talent in the draft, how quickly that transpires into teams. Look at Cleveland last year. Look at Tampa. Those teams struggled with offensive line. They plugged in around one offensive line talent. 
those teams got better. And it wasn't just because they got better quarterback player, better coaching. It's because our offensive line bought the time to do it. And they're always the unsung heroes. So I think that's a massive part for what Justin Herbert's going to do this year. But also last year, we saw the huge change in what Allen does now. He's not that deep threat anymore. You've got a lot of guys who will get the, the deep threat. You've got Mike Williams, you've got Johnson, you've got a few guys there. Uh, Guyton, I think, is still there. So you've got these guys who will do the, the deep the deep throws and, and make those deep plays. But what we did see in Allen was a 12% increase in targets in that sort of intermediary range, according to Football Outsiders. So that means he's got the volume absolutely locked. There's no one competing with him for targets. He was on targets per game last year, second in the NFL behind Devontae Adams. So no competition for targets, no significant additions to, to eliminate that. And then if we look at the 16-game pace that he would have had with Justin Herbert if they would played all 16 together, it would have been 118 catches, 1,175 yards, and 10 touchdowns. Would have put him as the wide receiver four last year. Mm. So I'm wheels up on Keenan Allen. He's, a, he's an auto pick in the third round for me as my wide receiver one. I think I've got him at wide receiver six. I'm very, very happy to get him. I'll take him over AJ Brown. I'll take him over yeah. um, a number like over Calvin Ridley. I think for me, Allen is just this. For me, he's the absolute league winner in the steal of the draft right now. Well, that's fascinating because you know I, I think some people will see the age and also maybe take for granted the fact that he's just been around so long. So we're always looking for that next guy that's going to you know just shatter the ceiling and be so spectacular. And we talk about Calvin Ridley, AJ Brown. Can those guys challenge for number one? And you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe Keenan Allen is a guy that can just kind of be that stable dude yet again who has more offside than we realize and we're just taking for granted because his name has been on the board for so many years. Yates, give me another wide receiver, in your opinion, that you think can reach that next level. Once we get outside the top 36 wide receivers in ADP, it is very difficult to find wide receivers that you feel can be the wide receiver one in their respective offenses and therefore see over 100 targets, right? Mm-hmm. Corey Davis was that guy. I think he's rising, but I still think he's outside the top 36. I think Jalen Waddle can be that guy. And then another guy that's sitting here that took a little bit of a tumble uh, after the Carson Wentz injury news, but is still sitting here at wide receiver 46 in our ADP consensus is Michael Pittman Jr. And in my opinion, he is the unquestioned wide receiver one in this offense here. I love the talent of Michael Pittman Jr. T.Y. Hilton is now a veteran receiver. He's going to fill a field stretching role uh, here for this offense, but I don't think that he's going to dominate targets here. Paris Campbell might not even have the starting role in this offense. And Zach Pascal, we know at this point, is just kind of a guy. So where are the targets going to go here? You've got some tight ends of Mo Alley Cox, Jack Doyle. I mean, Kylan Granson's playing well in training camp. And you've got the re- the receiving running backs out of the backfield, but you still need a predominant X. You still need that wide receiver one in this offense. It's Michael Pittman Jr. And Carson Wentz appears to be on track to play in week one. I think that's why Pittman took a little bit of a tumble in ADP is because we didn't know if it was going to be Jacob Eason throwing him the ball. Well, now we we have a pretty good idea that it's going to be Carson Wentz. I was willing to buy Michael Pittman Jr. this entire time, even if he rose all the way up to a wide receiver 36 price tag. And you can get him now at wide receiver 46 in ADP. You can get him super late. And that is where the recipe for success here is for him to be a league winner to absolutely smash his value. I put out on a a video on our YouTube channel earlier on this offseason saying, I would not be shocked if we are talking about drafting Michael Pittman Jr. as a top 24 wide receiver at this time next year because he's going to have such a good season. Very good. Very good. All right. So those are the wide receivers. We did the running backs. Let's move on to the quarterbacks. Murph, give me the quarterback who's going to be a league winner for people in 2021. Uh, this is such a homer pick, but <laughs> but, but I you have back. To go... You listen, baby. You back up every everything that you've said today. You've backed up. You have brought the receipts. <laughs> you have brought the numbers. So just keep going. Uh, I, and I will. I will keep going with with Tom Brady. And look, before <laughs> I get my absolute legs cut off for going, the guy can't run. <laughs> you know, he's got no mobility. He got six rushing yards last year. I understand all of that, and I'm still happy to buy him. First of all, you're getting him in the ninth round. People just still seem to forget about Tom Brady and they keep going with the age thing. You know, Tom Brady finished as the QB8 last year on a new team with no preseason, with COVID, all this malarkey. He still walked off into the sunset with a Lombardi trophy, as if anyone should have doubted. Now, what I did is I wanted to know sort of how real Tom Brady can get. So what I did is took his last four games in the regular season, took his last four games 
in the, the playoffs against, mm -hmm. you know, elite competition, basically created an average just to see what that would have looked like over a season. Right. So based on these final eight games where he went eight and oh, right? So he would have had about a 64, 65% completion percentage for, um, this was in, uh, taking a four-game average. So basically, he was averaging 300 yards a game passing, 47 passing touchdowns, and nine interceptions. Now, when you average that out, you know, he would have got just over 5,000 yards. And I think that's a little extreme, but still, you're looking at 47 passing touchdowns, nine interceptions. Let's take a couple off. Let's, let, let's, okay, let's go with listening to one Lombardi. makes sense. But you can start to sort of average this down. And realistically, you know, through for 4,600 last year, you can easily get to 4,700. I don't think that's going to be anybody's question. Through for 40 touchdowns, if you tack him on like another three or four, you cut a couple of the interceptions away. You've got three rushing touchdowns on the ground, which will happen. If that is his range of outcomes, he would have been last year sort of QB2, QB3 with those kind of numbers. So you're looking at 4,700, 44, 45 touchdowns. That's easily going to be his range of outcomes. And I think that will see him safely as a QB4, QB5 this season. So yeah. don't worry about the rushing yards. This guy's going to deliver. He's going to deliver again this season. And you can get him in the ninth round. You don't need to always pay up for quarterback. This is the late round guy that will just save that and get your depth all the way through. I got to tell you, Murph, what's so fascinating about the Brady situation is I see him go, you know, easily as, you know, the 12th quarterback in a lot of drafts. Sometimes I've seen other guys, you know, go ahead. You know, I've seen people want to take Jalen Hurts ahead of Brady, and I can understand the reasoning behind that. I disagree with it, but I understand it. And this is what's so fascinating because I think when you're looking at this, today we're giving you so many guys with great values, right? Guys that really can outperform their ADP, but also some guys, you know, Murph has mentioned Keenan Allen, Tom Brady, guys that are very steady. And sometimes we do get a little infatuated with the potential and we sometimes forget a little bit too much about the established. And I think it's good to remind everybody about that. Yates, who's the quarterback for you that you've got on that list? One of the strategies that I love this year is taking one of these quarterbacks at the back end of the top 12, right? So a Tom Brady, a Matthew Stafford, uh, even a Ryan Tannehill. One of these guys, uh, even if you want to take Jalen Hurts as, as the 12th quarterback off the board, and then you pair him with Trey Lance. Uh, oh, Trey Lance, the yeah. quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, <laughs> man. I mean, this guy has just shown up big time here in the preseason throughout training camp. I believe that there is a very strong possibility that he starts week one against Detroit. Uh, and we're seeing him push the ball deep downfield, which is what Kyle Shanahan wants. We've, he, we know he's got the arm talent. And then we haven't even seen his like rushing mobility. We really have not even seen that on display yet. So as far as a quarterback that is still going in, I mean, in traditional leagues, he's going in the 13th, 14th round because we just don't know when exactly he's going to start. So you don't need to draft him as your QB one. But if I saw a team in the uh, sleeper bowl last night do this, where they took Trey Lance ahead of guys like Trevor Lawrence, Joe Burrow, Ryan Tannehill, Tom Brady, they took him in the 10th round, I believe 11th round. And then they came back a couple rounds later and Ryan Tannehill was still somehow there in the 13th round. So they grabbed Ryan Tannehill, but even grabbing like a steady rock solid, just QB two, one of those guys. Yeah, a Kirk Cousins, a Derek Carr, one of these guys that you can grab in a one QB format to start the first couple weeks of the season. And then once we know that Trey Lance is going to take over, you just start Trey Lance every single week because he's going to bring everything that Jalen Hurts has in his, you know, going in his way as far as the rushing upside. Trey Lance brings that and more. And then he has the arm talent, the passing capability that Jalen Hurts doesn't. And then he has the receiving weapons that Jalen Hurts doesn't. So, and the coaching that Jalen Hurts doesn't. So everything that people love about Jalen Hurts, we need to be directing that, redirecting that to Trey Lance. So if you can grab a Tom Brady, who I think is an extremely safe option, and then you can, uh, in case something happens with his age, right? If it does tail off, right. uh, all he needs to do is just get the ball out to his playmakers in this offense. But if it does tail off, that's something that we have to talk about. If it does tail off, then you've got Trey Lance sitting there waiting for you to be able to be this league winner. And I talked about it with Trey Sermon, the schedule week 11 on uh -huh. like yeah. league winning upside oh, yeah. through and through. Yeah. There you go. And on top, on top of that with, with Lance. Now I've done this in a couple of drafts where I've taken Lance as my QB one for exactly this purpose. And then gone back around later and got Ben Roethlisberger, who's massively being slept on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're projecting three top 24 wide receivers, yet Ben is like QB 17, QB 18 off the board. That makes no sense. Both those statements cannot be true. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> but ADP is telling us that is true. See, well, I but have it's no the same pro- reason, Murph. We guys, we just take for granted the guys who've just been there. Exactly. They're not interesting. They don't make everybody go ooh and ah when you take them in the draft room with your friends. But well, who cares? At the end of the day, you want to be the person at the top of the standings, not the person who yeah. gets oohs and ahs in the draft. So. You know, look, I've done this strategy too, and I've done it in Superflex, just to kind of give another wrinkle here, where mm. I have been, uh, you know, I take my QB1, I did it in a draft last weekend, actually, where I think I took Rodgers as my one, mm. and then I went around early or so on Trey Lance, and then backed it up with Carr, and I think I did with Darnold too, just four quarterbacks in that league, because it was like, I don't know, 18 rounds, it was a very deep draft, so wanted to have some depth there just in case of injuries, but this is a very simple thing to do where you can basically have your cake and eat it too. And that's what you want to be able to do when you see talent. And Yates is giving you a great uh, approach here in terms of getting the talent on your roster and at the same time giving yourself an insurance policy. Last position here. Yates, let's start with you with this one. Tight end, who is your league winner? You stayed on brand with Trey Lance. I can only hope you're staying on brand here. Yeah, we're definitely staying on brand. Uh, John New Smith here. Uh, I mean, John New Smith in our ADP consensus, you look at where, and our ADP consensus does a fantastic job of bringing in all these different sites, giving you the average. In fan tracks, he's going as the tight end 16 off the board. In FFC, the tight end 14 off the board. In sleeper, the tight end 16 off the board. So I just, uh, I, I don't get it. Like, I, I do either, not man. get it. I, you would Why think by now, is... would have, we would have, we, I feel like you and I have adjusted the market personally on a lot of players. But no it's matter crazy. how much, it's like we hate Joe and Yates when it comes to Johnny Smith. We just refuse to buy in, and I don't get it, man. It is crazy. I think people are putting way too much stock in Hunter Henry's presence here on this roster. Hunter Henry, <clears throat> excuse me, Hunter Henry has a injury history that you know is long and detailed, and he's missing time currently. Uh, he's now starting to come back, but Johnny Smith had that ankle injury scare, and then he came back to practice. He's been completely involved in in this offense, especially around the red zone. He's going to be force fed targets. I. I just don't get it, man. So John New Smith, for where you're getting him, as you if you can get him as even if you want to take two tight ends and kind of deploy the same kind of strategy that I talked about with the quarterback position, you want to grab one of those safe, those guys that you view as a safe tight end, but you want to double it down and grab a John New Smith. I grab Tyler Higby in one draft, and then I grab Johnny Smith, you know, to back him up just a couple rounds later. And I feel like that's putting a corner here on the tight end market. One of those guys is going to come through in Johnny Smith. I feel like at his current price tag, again, it's all relative to price but an absolute league winner this year. I think, uh, relatively speaking, one of those two names might be one of Murph's too. Murph, who's your tight end? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 Tyler Higby. I, I can summarize the, the reason why Johnny Smith isn't going up boards, and it's not because I disagree with you, because I completely agree. But you've got to remember that the average person will just look at the history of Johnny Smith, and he's never got over 500 yards receiving right. in the season. And that's all it is. It's, go it's go just back and people... watch the first five-week game film and then come back to me and d- <laughs> tell me you're not excited about that kind of player. I mean, come on. Yeah. But that's why it is. People people go, oh, no, I've is. heard you're that right. name Johnny Smith, and they look at the history and go, oh, he's never done anything, so I'm not going to go right. there. That's all it is. But, um, but yeah, let's just cash in. Let's all cash in and take advantage of the people that, that don't watch film. Yeah, I, I, mine's with, with Tyler Higby. Um, now, listen, Tyler Higby's going off the ball as a tight end 11, so he's sort of back end of of the tight end ones and again this is another one i'm buying all into this rams offense with stafford you know people underestimate what what stafford is going to bring mm-hmm. to yep. this this offense and the other thing is we've already seen tyler higby be good you know that five game spell towards the end of 2019 he got paid it was highly productive um and then you look at last season and was like oh we well, didn't really do it last year but there was some there were some big things last year in the play calling that again signal towards this big breakout that we're going to get from Tyler Higby, and I'm, I'm that confident I'm going to say we are going to get this breakout from Tyler Higby. You know, his yards from per reception jumped from 10.6 in 2019 to 11.8 in 2020. His touchdowns jumped from three to five, despite seeing 29 less targets. You know, it's all trending upwards for Tyler Higby. There's no Everett. That's 62 targets vacated. Who are they going to go to? They're not all going to go to Higby, but there's no one else that's coming in to replace that. You know, you get more to Woods, you get a little bit to Cup, but a, a fair line share of that will go to Tyler Higby. And then, yeah, as we mentioned, we've got this this QB upgrade from Goff, who is one of, you know, just, yeah, he's a guy that you never really want to watch, get excited watching, to, no. to Stafford, who's going to make him relevant. You know, my hot take is that, you know, Tyler Higby's going to be a top five tight end this year. There's absolutely zero doubt in my mind. I will walk away from drafts 78, 82% of the time with Tyler Higby as my tight end and 
wheels up, let's go, because he <laughs> he's gonna have a huge season, and I'm I'll stake everything on it. Like, it's, and both these guys just... free tight ends, and this is the free, point I keep yeah. making. The worst thing you can do is go into that middle. If you want to take Kelsey Waller Kittle, that's fine. All of that is justified. It's that middle that can really get you in trouble because you're missing out on the depth of wide receiver at running back, and we just gave you two guys that we think are basically free tight ends that could finish in that top six, top seven, who maybe even top five, who knows if things break right. All right, Murph, your guys, just to recap, were David Montgomery at the running back position, James Robinson, Trey Sermon at wide receiver, Keenan Allen, Robert Woods, Robbie Anderson, Tom Brady, the quarterback, Tyler Higby. Those are Murph's league winners. Yates, who are your league winners? Just one more time to recap for everyone. Yeah, so at the running back position, I've got Trey Sermon, Daryl Henderson, and Tony Jones Jr., at wide receiver, I've got Robert Woods, Jalen Waddle, Michael Pittman Jr. Then at tight end, I've got Johnu Smith, of course. And then at quarterback, I've got Trey Lance, of course. <laughs> On brand. On That's brand. That's right. Yates On strong. Brand. All right, let's uh, hit a couple mailbag questions. We'll lightning round this, and then we'll call it a day. This one's from at Clinic Cap. Uh, we've gotten to the point this offseason where most guys have been talked about and the takes have been made. Are you changing your stance on a guy that you were out on earlier, but you're now in at this point in the season murph you, you got one for uh, that you've changed your tune on i mentioned robinson is one of mine do you have one i'm never really out on players it just depends on what their sort of cost is going for i guess for me the the one that i kind of am, am turning around a little bit more is is kenny Golladay. i wasn't overly attracted to kenny Golladay at the start of the season but now seeing what's happening in camp he's someone for me that i'm probably a little bit more in on not loads, um, only because I still think the wide receivers we've talked about have got a better range of outcomes. But do you know what? For the price you can get Kenny Galladay, he, he's well worth picking up. I I kind of didn't really invest anything in him or, or, or picked him up or drafted him a lot. So I, he's someone I've turned around a little bit based on what I've seen in the preseason. Yates, here's a question for you from Da Equinox FF. He wants to know uh, top five best backups to keep an eye on due to all the injuries. I assume... Jamal Williams, Gus Edwards, right? Those are two guys. Is there anything, anybody else you want to throw into that pile that you've really got at a close eye on? Uh, Gus Edwards, for sure. Uh, Tony Pollard, of course. Pollard. Uh, even though Zeke is super durable, uh, Tony Pollard has that league winning upside. Uh, definitely could have included him in this list, but uh, he needs some things to go his way. Outside of that, I really don't think that there's one that I can like pinpoint and I'm like, yes, this is the guy that you've got to get what about on your, your boy in New Orleans you were talking up earlier. Yeah, I was going to say. Mean, I mean, Tony Jones Jr. is one of the guys that I think will have some standalone value. So I don't know if he is like one of those like true like backups that I even needs an injury to go, you know, uh, kind of like Gus Edwards, though. So, yeah, I guess you could include Tony Jones in, in that conversation. All right. Last one from the fantasy Sven. All right. Here you go. A.J. Brown, top five, top 10 or top 15 wide receiver. Where does he finish, Yates? Uh, I'll go top 10. I think that for him to knock out one of those guys in the top five, he's going to have to get insane volume, uh, which uh, absolutely could happen. But, you know, I think that top 10 is the, probably the most likely outcome. Well, considering where you have Keenan Allen, I imagine top five is not available for you, Murph. But I don't want to speak for you Who, where you got A.J. Brown. <laughs> no, he's, he's not. Uh, I've got Keenan Allen uh, above. Uh, I've got him at seven. I've kind of got him. I keep flipping him and Justin Jefferson backwards and forwards. So that's that's seven, eight range, depending on how how the wind blows. I think they're they're wafer thin close. So that's kind of where I've got him. Um, I'm not worried about Julio. In fact, I think Julio does him a favor if anything. So mm -hmm, I agree. But I just again, it's just the volume. I think if he was getting ninety receptions plus, he'd be there. But he's not, and I can't see it. All right, uh, you could follow Murph on the Twitter machine at Murph underscore NFL. You can also follow them at Five Yard Rush, which is the podcast handle over on Twitter, and subscribe to that podcast. Again, they, they do the playbook, the fantasy football playbook. It's it's a show with passion, great stats, great humor. I urge everybody to go check it out. Murph, I can't thank you enough for your time, for your insights, for your stats, for your personality, for everything. And like I said, man, our friendship over the years, one of the things that also sucked about pandemic is you and I had plans to hang out, have a nice steak dinner in New York, and that got canceled, unfortunately. So hopefully, maybe next year, we can do that. It's still on the books. You and I have talked about that. But uh, again, please, everybody, go check out that Five Yard Rush podcast. Murph, any final thoughts here? Just again, pleasure to be with you both. Um, shame that Tags isn't here, but it's, you know, that's probably the only bit of sweet part. But it, you know, it's good to see some positive trending news on on his health and you know from everyone at five yard and 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 everyone across the pond you know we're all sending 
regards to him and his family and everyone um but other than that just this is a blast and i look forward to catching up with anyone that wants to follow me on on the back of this and uh either hound me down or, or stop talking about old guys and, and <laughs> point me the way as some rookies. I, I don't mind. It's fine. Uh, hey, you had Trey Sermon on that list last time I, I checked. It's okay. Again, go follow my five yard rush. And uh, I want to echo those sentiments. Thank you everybody over the last week or so who have reached out to all of us about the health of our brother, Mike Taglier. We're still very hopeful. We're still, uh, he's still out there fighting. And uh, again, when we try to give updates, we're very careful what we do, but just want to appreciate all the love and support that everybody showed him. Tags hit 100,000 followers on Twitter in case you missed yeah. it, which is a beautiful thing. So uh, I think uh, at some point in time it's going to make him very happy when he realizes just what's going on there and uh, how much love and support this industry has given the fans of the show, the family here at Fantasy Pros, our colleagues, and everyone in between. So, uh, look, fantasy football is here. This is our joy. Thank you for being part of it, as always. Also, I want to thank the sponsors of today's show, as we always do. Uh, Canna Dips, make sure you go over to uh, CannaDipsCBD.com, promo code FP20. You can also go and get your Bachans. Again, Bachans is that Japanese-American barbecue sauce I was telling you about. B-A-C-H-A-N-S.com slash Fantasy Pros. Use that promo code Fantasy Pros at the checkout. And I know you like playing fantasy football, so here's another chance to win a lot of cash and doing it. So, all you got to do to get into this big time tournament, RT Sports, is go to rtsports.com, use the promo code tw- uh, promo code pros, get 20% off that price match and that deposit. Again, that's rtsports.com. And do not forget, we have the contest at fantasypros.com. Fantasypros.com slash contest. Only a few days left. Get in there for your CEH autographed helmet. And if your draft is coming up, Great. If your season is right on the precipice, we all know, like all of, all of ours, you want to upgrade your membership with us here at Fantasy Pros, and we got a great, easy way to do it. FantasyPros.com slash offers. All you got to do, make a 10% deposit on our partner sites, Underdog, FanDuel, and DraftKings. One of those, put 10 bucks in, play some more fantasy, and you get six free months of our Hall of Fame package. $65 value in your pocket. You are welcome, everybody. That'll do it for us, but the story of the game goes on. For Yates and Murph, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.